right, you got Hebrews chapter 11 today. I'm glad that you came. Let's stand, shall we? We're going to start in verse 32. And it says, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts, mountains, dens, caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Wherefore, seeing we're all so compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher, finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And let's pray. Father, we thank you again now, Lord, for the opportunity one more time to open this book. And Lord, we pray that, Lord, you'll bless us today, encourage us today. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us today. Lord, in the few minutes that we have, Lord, really our time seems to go by rather rapidly. At least to me it does. And so, Father, I pray you'll help us, Lord. Help me to say what you would have me to say. Lord, I pray you'll give me clearness of thought. Lord, I pray that you'll help me this morning. Lord, I depend upon you. Lord, I absolutely depend upon you today, Lord, to say what needs to be said. And Lord, I pray that you'll help me not to say what doesn't need to be said. Lord, I pray today that you help us. Lord, we pray for those who, uh, Lord, are in beds of affliction today, who simply could not be here. Uh, Lord, I, I do pray for them today. Lord, for uh, uh, Bonnie and uh, Arnold and and uh, uh, Judy that are traveling back from West Virginia, Lord, we pray that you'll give them, Lord, traveling mercy today. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us, we ask. Lord, we want to pray for America today. Lord, we pray about that in, 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 that in, in wrath you would remember mercy. And Lord, that you would be merciful to us. Lord, I think we look at this election coming up as being, Lord, pivotal. Lord, we, we can't help but believe, Lord, that if the wrong person gets in, that, Lord, we're going to have terrible trouble. But, Lord, sometimes I think we get, we've gotten what we wanted and, Lord, I realize the majority of the people in here did not want that. But Lord, unfortunately, the majority of Americans seem to have wanted free everything. Lord, I pray that you'll help our country. Now, Lord, bless, we pray in these few moments. Lord, I, I, pray for, I pray, Lord, for those little kids downstairs and those teachers downstairs. Lord, you'll help them. Again, Lord, we just thank you so very much for your love and your mercy to us. Lord, bless, we pray now in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. And amen, you may be seated. The idea really in, in Hebrews chapter 11 is about faith. If you read Hebrews 11, it's about faith. And, and really, our, the last, one of the last things that we, we read there 
in verse 39, and these all having obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise. The idea of Hebrews, look back at chapter 6 and verse 12. And chapter 6 and verse 12. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The idea of Hebrews is this, simply that through faith and patience, you'll note that we read chapter 12, verse 1, let us run with patience the race, what race? The race of faith, the race of faith with patience. That is the idea of Hebrews. We are in a race. We are in a journey. Most people, if I said to you this morning, how many are satisfied with the destination that you're going to get to one day? Man, I, I say almost everybody raised their hand. Yeah, preacher, I'm, I'll, I'll be more than satisfied. I believe it was Job said that I shall be satisfied when I wake with his likeness. When we get to heaven, brethren, we're going to be more than satisfied that heaven will be more than our expectations here. We used that analogy this morning in Sunday school, which is at 9.30, and we're starting the book of Revelation, and uh, we may be there for a long time, but we want to invite you to Sunday school at 9.30. But we used the analogy in Sunday school this morning. Most people like that, you know, fry it, that blooming onion, that big onion, you know, you fry it. But again... You know, you're waiting for the steak. So if they came and took the onion away before this, it was done, because they brought your steak, you wouldn't say much. The truth is that we're looking forward to that steak dinner. We're looking forward to heaven. We will be satisfied when we get to heaven. When we get there, we're going to be satisfied. I'm not sure that they're... The Bible says this. I'll just say this is what the Bible says. He shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. I'm not sure that there won't be some tears in heaven. Perhaps tears over what we saw we could have done for Christ if we had only done something for Christ. Maybe things that we could have had that if we simply prayed a little more. Maybe there'll be tears over those that we knew in this life. Because if you read that, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, for the former things are passed away, and neither shall there be any more death, nor crying, nor sorrow, nor pain, for the former things are passed away. That occurs after chapter 20, and whoso is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That occurs after that. Perhaps there will be tears in heaven. Someone asked me this one time, and I'll just say this in way of passing. People say, well, we remember people that we have known in this life who are lost and who are not in heaven. No, I do not believe that to be so. There's a verse in the Bible, I can't recall where it is right now. But we will not remember those that God will wipe that from our memory. How could that possibly be heaven if we remembered those people that we knew in this lifetime that did not make it? So uh, we're going to be satisfied when we get to heaven. We are satisfied with the destination. But we are careless about the journey. Now, careless has a couple of meanings. People, people say, somebody, my mother says, you're just careless. You're not, my wife would say this about my handwriting. If you've ever seen my handwriting, I can read it really well. They ask at the bus garage, how long did it take you to learn how to sign like that? It took me months to perfect my signature, but I've got it. But my wife would say, you're pretty careless about your, your writing. My curse, and even I can't read it sometimes, but... Careless. We're careless about it. That people aren't paying attention. Do you ever pay? A, do you, you ever drive down the road, particularly on a four-lane highway? You ever drive down the road and notice people in the car next to you? Do you ever see anybody reading a newspaper driving down the road to work? Well, I, I've seen people reading newspapers. Do you ever see women putting on makeup while they're driving down the road to work? We we'll say, well. You ever see people trying to eat driving down the road to work? You ever see people texting driving down the road? I'm, I'm writing. But, you know, you know, I know that there are probably some of you, because I've known people, who can text without even looking at it. But you ever see people, they're, they're careless. People have accidents uh, from that, and people get killed. I, 
I, I would say to you that is why they make that made that law. You know, you can't text in New York. I, that they made the law. You can't talk on a hand receiver. You see people doing that. We would say that they're careless. I mean, anybody knows you can't eat and drive. I know people try. They get it all over them. And, you know, they're trying to look down, trying to get it off of them. And uh, they're texting while they're driving. They're talking on the telephone while they're driving. They're arguing when they're driving. You ever see people who are arguing as they drive down the road? They're doing that, not paying. They're careless. But careless also has a second meaning. It means unconcerned. People are satisfied with the destination, but they are careless or they are unconcerned about the journey. They're unconcerned about it. But here the Bible tells us in chapter 12 and verse 1, it tells us that we ought to run the race with patience. People, sometimes people say, well, they're just unconcerned, which means they could care less. But think about that word, care less. Somebody says, well, I couldn't care less. Doesn't mean that they're not attentive. Doesn't mean that they're texting while they're driving. It doesn't mean they're talking on the telephone while they're cutting the grass or doing that kind of thing. It means that they, I, could care, I couldn't care less. It means they're totally unconcerned about what's going on around them. They say, well, I could care less about the election that's coming up. Now, let me say this. You better not be unconcerned about the election. Uh, you, you better be concerned about the election. But somebody says, well, I could care less. It means they're unconcerned about it. Well, I, I could care less what we have for supper tonight, which means they really don't care what you have. They they care less. It doesn't mean that they're, they're not careful. It means they, could, they're, they're, they, they really are, are unconcerned about it. Our verse says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Look back at 1 Corinthians real quickly. 1 Corinthians and chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And notice what Paul says here. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Oh, we'll start in about verse 24. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24. It tells us this. Let's see. Chapter 9, verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race? Run all. But one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Paul says, using the sports analogy, which is a good one here, that when you're in a race, when you're in a race, you run to win. I've said, and I, I repeatedly say this, I hate losing. Somebody said, you show me a good loser, I'll show you a loser. I mean, I, I don't like losing. I, I don't like losing. And I know that you think I'm joking when I say, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. But I, I, and I don't mean it, you know, like everybody's looking for an edge. Everybody's looking for an edge. I hate to lose. I don't like losing. That's why I don't do some things, because I don't want to lose. I don't want to get in a battle of wits with my wife. I'll probably wind up losing. Listen, it is like they that run in a race run all. If you're going to be in a race, you're going to run. You're going to run to win. I, I don't think I know very people, unless you play ASO, I don't think I know many people who are in it uh, just to, well, I'm just going to run the race. Brother, if I'm going to run the race, I want to win. That's what I want to do. I want to win. Sometimes that kind of attitude gets you in trouble. And, and our, our brother Tom, Tom Morley for a long time wouldn't come here because he and I used to coach against each other in, in soccer. And, and I, I, I hated losing. And so I would do everything I could to beat him. I like winning. Paul said, they that run in a race, if you're saved today, you're running in a race. And if you're in a race, you need to train for the race. Notice what he says there in, in chapter 9. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. 
In other words, what Paul's saying is that if you're in some kind of a sporting event, or if you play organized sports, if you play organized sports, if you play baseball, it's not a good idea to pick a baseball up and go out there and start throwing the ball as hard as you can. You got to kind of get warmed up. You got to kind of train for it. I know that when I played soccer in school, and uh, we'd always have, you know, in practice, man, we had to go out there and do exercises. I hated exercise, but you had to do them. You had to run. You had to do that. Why? Uh, because we're training to win. That's what we want to do. We want to win. When I was in school, we didn't want to lose. When I, when I coached Little League, I always said to the boys, and I had some girls on the team too, I, I always say to them, Mary, hey, do you guys just want to have a good time or do you want to win? And they said, well, we want to win. I said, all right, then let's do this, and this, and this, and this. If you're in a race, you're going to run to win it. If you have any backbone, any gumption, you're going to run to win it. Now, you may not win the race. You may not always hit a home run. You may not always throw a touchdown. You may not always strike the guy out, but you're at least in the race, and you're trying to do that. And Paul said, know ye not that they would run in the race. Paul said, if Paul's a writer of Hebrews, they're just going to say he is this morning. If, if Paul wrote Hebrews, he said, let us run. If we're in a race, we're running, and we're running to win the race. That is what we're doing. Nobody wants to look, if you would, at Philippians, book of Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, and verse, I'll start about verse 10. If, if you're in a race, man, you ought to want to win. Men, men particularly, I'll just say this about men. Men have a, uh, I like to call it a hunter complex. Men have a, and, and that's the way God made them. I mean, that, that's just the way it is. Men have a, 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 an attitude of whatever is next on their list, that's what they're going to be the best at. Or that's what they're going to try to gain. That's why, that's why a lot of times, I didn't say all the time, when, you know, guys meet a girl, they say, oh, boy, I'm thinking I'm going to marry her, I'm going to love her, blah, 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 blah. And they get married. Before they get married, it's like they bring flowers, they bring candy, they open the door, they, uh, they're on their best behavior, they never say, you know, never has heard a discouraging word. Uh, everything is uh, just wonderful. Everything is fine. Until they get married. Then it's like, you're too fat. What do you need chocolate for? I don't get chocolate now. What's wrong? Your arm broke? Can't open the door for yourself? You know, that kind of thing. And it's like, once men get that, what they're aiming for, then they move on. If I, in my, with, or in, in any case, for example, if I'm going to be a ball player, I'm going to be the best ball player I can. If I'm going to be a, 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 a hunt, I'm going to be the best hunter I can. If you're in a race, you're going to be the best racer that you can. I never like track very much, too much running, too much running. But if we're in a race, we're running to win it. We're going to be the men particularly. Look at it, man. I want to win the race. We're in Philippians chapter 3. It says this beginning in verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. I want to know him. Paul said, it's either 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 2, 2. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul said, I want to know Christ. That was his life's ambition. That was his, one of his life's ambition, one of his goals. He wanted to know Christ. Is that yours? Well, I'm a preacher, I'm satisfied with going to heaven. Preacher, I'm just satisfied. I'm satisfied with, with my destination. Preacher, I'm satisfied that I'm going to go to heaven. And many are like that, but they are careless about the journey. That I may know him, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that, for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, 
I count not myself to have apprehended. Paul said, I haven't got there yet. But he said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Sometimes the devil likes to, the devil constantly likes to torment us. You know, the devil will bring things up and, and he'll say this, but what about this and what about that? Now listen to me, brethren. Listen to me. The devil wants to torment you. The Bible says, Paul says here, forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting those things. You can't do anything about it. The past are gone. Forgetting those things which are behind. And reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark. I press toward the mark. I'm pressing toward the goal line. For the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, in Hebrews chapter 12 and, and in verse 1, it tells us there that we have a definite aim. There is a definite aim. We, he said, let us therefore run with patience. Let us run with patience the race. What is the aim that we're aiming for? To run the race with patience. That is our aim. To try and run the race with patience. Now, so I said, well, I don't have a lot of patience. Well, if you pray for it, you're probably going to have a lot of trouble because tribulation work is patience. So, but you say, I want to have more patience. We are in this race. Our aim is to run the race with patience. That is what we're trying to do. Now, most people, most people, if I were to say, there's some of our younger people in here, and some of you may recall this when you were younger. Somebody said, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be Davy Crockett. That's what I want to be when I grow up. I want to be Davy Crockett. I want to be a cowboy. That's what I want to be. Uh, I'm trying to think, when I was a kid, what do I want? I want to be a cowboy when I grow up. When I got a little, I want a baseball player when I grow up. Everybody's got these aims. I'm sure, I'm pretty sure, I think so anyway, Not all girls do, but some girls have a, a hope chest because they hope they get married someday. I mean, that, you know, what do you want to do? I hope to get married someday. What do you want to be? I want to be an engineer. I want to drive a train. John got to be that. John was a, got to drive trains. I want to be a train engineer. You know, choo -choo, that, I want to be that. I want to be a ball player. I want to be this. I want to be that. Everybody, when they're growing up, seems to have an aim of some kind about what they, they want to do in life. This is what I want to do. Some people say, well, this is what I, I want to have fame. I want to be somebody famous. Other people say, well, I want to make a lot of money. I want to make a lot of money. I want to be rich. I want to be wealthy. That's what I want to be. I, I want to spend my time like the rich man in Luke chapter 12, Let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. That's what I want to do. I want to live it up. I don't care anything else. That guy didn't care anything about God. Jesus said in the parable, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose things shall these be? People are growing up, and particularly people, and, and we do this, if we're not saved, we have this idea, I want to make money, I want to be this, I want to be a cowboy. I want to be a, uh, an engineer. I want to be an astronaut. I want to fly F-15s. I want to do this. I want to do that. But the Bible says, and this is our aim, let us run with patience the race is set before us. Have you ever considered, okay, all right, so you're going to be an F-15 fighter pilot. I'd, I'd have loved to have done that. I, I, really, I would have loved to have done that. Okay, so you're going to be an F-15. Okay, let's say you hit it rich and you go out in the backyard like Uncle Jed and you shoot at a groundhog and you struck Texas tea, oil, crude oil. First thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. You hit, you hit it, man. You hit the mother load. You, you went out in the backyard and you were digging in. In the, uh, your front yard, you're going to hide your money because you don't trust banks. You hide your money out there, and you hit a vein of gold. Let's say, oh, you went invested in the stock market, and, man, you hit it big in the stock market. And, and uh, man, now you're, you're 
I don't know why they say this, but you're filthy rich and, and man, you got a ton of money. Suppose you, were, suppose you meet the goals in life that you've set out for yourself. Then what? Then what do you do? These famous type people, these like singers or uh, baseball players, basketball players, I think particularly basketball players, basketball players I think make more money than anybody else. I mean, those guys, but many of them. I read this statistic, like somewhere between 60 to 70% of basketball players, five years after they're out of the NBA, are, are uh, bankrupt. They're broke. Allen Iverson, one of the highest paid guys that ever played basketball, broke. Look, suppose you reach your goal in life. Suppose you aim for the stars and you hit it. Then what? You see these famous type people, they, and I, I quote that famous, you know, they're not so famous to me. They're pretty big in their own eyes, but you say, Preacher, why, why would somebody who has all the money in the world, why would they start using drugs and become dope heads and, and alcoholics? And why is it that it seems like People in Hollywood go from one person to the next, and, and they're trying to, to uh, get all that. Get all you can, can all you can get. Because once you reach the top, once you reach it up here, they're going to pay you a, $150 million over six years to hit a baseball. Now, I've got to tell you, if they paid me that, I look, if they gave me $100,000, I'd do it. But you've got these, these people, they're, they're rich, and you say, preacher, they seem to go off the dead end, and, and sometimes they wind up killing themselves. Which they do. Why do they do that? Man, it seems like they'd have the world by the tail, all the money, all the fame, uh, the popularity, everything. Because once you reach up here, there ain't any place else to go but down. So suppose you, suppose you set some big goal out in life and you reach it. So what then? What do you do then? What happens then? Paul says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. What is it that God would have me to do? Because secondly, this, God has a path laid out for you. And that verse that we read, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. That is a path that God has laid out for us. God has something for you. That verse we read in 1 Corinthians, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but only one receiveth the prize. Maybe somebody knows this. I, I, I surely don't. I've often thought about it. When you go through Fort Drum, and that obstacle course is over there on your right-hand side, can anybody use that? Anybody? Nobody? You want to kill? Nobody knows. I don't either. But anyway, life is sometimes like an obstacle course. And God, sometimes, we think of Job. I, when you read Job, you come up with a universal question. Why do the righteous suffer? Why is it that the righteous sometimes suffer? Man, I'm trying to run with patience the race is set before us. Because let's, let's face it, folks. There are some Christians that do wind up with cancer. There are some Christians who have heart problems. There are people who lose their jobs. There are people that have family problems. And when Paul says, let us run with, 
race, let us run with patience the race, so they that run, run all. The idea is that there's it's obstacles in our way to get around. So we've attained great success and popularity. So what then? What are you going to do then? For rich people, it's only down. I'm talking about people who are lost. They have no purpose. They have no goal. They have, no, they have really no reason for living. That's why that you read about them from time to time, these famous, wealthy Hollywood types kill themselves. And I look at that and say, well, why would they do that? Because once you get here without God, there's no place to go. But, now, but the Bible says to we who are saved now. As I said at the beginning, people are satisfied with the destination, but they're a little careless about the journey. Brother, if you're going to run the race with patience, if you're going to run it and not be unconcerned, say, ah, I'm not concerned about it. I said, I said to my wife, something yesterday and and she said to me well the reason that you feel that way is because and it's true about this the church is my life I, I, this is my life this is it but the, the, the thing is that if we're saved and on our way to heaven it ought to be that true about everybody the church ought to be our life it's when our life is, it wraps around, but people are careless about it. They're unconcerned about it. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. That's all that matters. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to try to reach the goals that I've set out in my life, and they give little thought about what God wants them to do. When I was in high school, I still have the book. When I was in high school, I had it written out, my goals for my life. I wanted to be a farmer. Oh, yes. But not one of those dairy farmers. Who'd want to be a dairy? I want the real money. I want to be a beef farmer. That's where the money is in beef farming. My ag teacher, my FA, Mr. Sampson. You still see the guy. He and I had sat down several times, gone over everything that or at least looking at what was needed. I was going to move to Montana. I was going to have a big, I'm going to be cattle baron of Montana. That's what I'm going to be. I wanted to travel. I wanted to go all over the United States. I think by God's grace, I've been, able, I've been in every state on this side of the Mississippi and some on the other side. But that's what I wanted to do. Hey, Jenkins, you want to be a preacher? What, are you kidding me? Who'd want to be a preacher? I mean, come on. Who'd want to be a preacher? Not me. I wouldn't want to be a preacher. I would not want to be a preacher. If it's the last job in the world where you're going to make money, I wouldn't want to be a preacher. I've seen Don McKnight. He was my preacher. I wouldn't want to be a preacher. And he said to me one time, if you can do anything else, I said this to one of our boys here, he said to me one time, he said, if you can do anything else besides be a preacher, you better do that. Huh? He said, it's hard. It's hard standing with a mother and father just lost their five kids in a fire. He said, that's hard. It's hard to stand beside someone whose husband, their husband had just died or their wife had just died. That's hard. I had my goals in my life set out what I wanted to do. But did you ever think what it is, what God would have you to do? What is it that God would have you to do? You say, preacher, you're trying to get me to be a preacher? No, of course not. What is it? I'm just saying that God's got a course laid out for us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. God has a course set out for us. God has a course that he has set out for us, and it, whatever it may be. And, and, and so that would involve, as we make the race our occupation, see, 
you say, well, does God want... No, I'm not saying that God... I mean, we've got some loggers, we've got carpenters, we've got uh, uh, some farmers, we've got all kinds of people in here, we've got housewives. Not, and I'm, look, I'm saying this, I'm just saying this. You, can, you say, oh, preacher, you're putting out... No, I'm not. I've said this before, I believe that a woman will never realize her highest calling until that's what she does, that's what God intended for her. Now, you say, you're trying to get me to do something? No. I'm saying that wherever God has you, that our relationship with God as we make the journey is involved in our occupation. It's, it's involved in our relationships, who our friends are. If you live godly, you don't have to worry about your friends leaving you. They'll run away from you as fast as they can. Because they don't want to hear what you got. They don't want to hear that. Let us run with patience. The race, the path that God has laid out for us. Though there be obstacles, though there be problems in the way, let us run with patience that which God has laid out. Thirdly, this. There's a steady progress here. There is a steady progress here as we continually advance. We're advancing on. Um, we're pressing on the upper way, new heights we're gaining every day. Now, I, I have to say this, that if you live that way, probably people that you knew before you were saved probably won't have much to do with you. If you're all the time asking them out to church, if you're all the time, you know, hey, this is what we're going on in church, we're doing this, blah, blah, blah. Hey, you ever thought about going to heaven when you died? You know, people are going to kind of run the other way. Here, now let me, let me change that. I know a guy, I know a preacher. I know a preacher. He's a good guy. He really is a good guy. I like the guy. I get along with the guy great. He and I can sit down and talk, and he and I can uh, uh, have good conversations about the Bible, and he and I agree, you know, just about with everything in the Bible. There are some things, you know, that, hey, look, Unless something has radically happened in the last six months, is there anybody in here that totally agrees with everything about the preacher? I did not think so. All right, all right, I got one guy on the back row. But by and large, not everybody's going to agree with everything about everything in the Bible. That's just the way it is. But this, this your good brother, changed his Bible changed his music, changed his standards. Now, there's a steady progression in our life. Okay, we're, we're not going to be careless about the journey. We're, go, we're going to be careful about the journey. It's not that we're not unconcerned. We are concerned about the journey that we're taking. This good brother changed just about everything. And now the church is falling apart. And he can't get it back. Can't understand what's happened. Well, I got a really good idea what's happened. I have a good idea. Look, we're, we're running with patience. The race, the course that is set before us, we're running with that, which means that we're still in the race that we're accomplished about, we're running the race. There's a steady progression. <clears throat> if I was to ever run in a race, which my granddaughter can outrun me now, which I'm ashamed to admit, but if I was to ever run in a race, it would not be a sprint. I one time timed myself in a 100-yard dash, and I think I ran it like 13 seconds. I mean, that was pitiful. I used to run... Like, I, I, really, I used to run like five miles a day. Ah, once you get going, that's nah, pretty good. In college, you had to run two miles in 12 minutes, which, you know, six-minute mile, that wasn't such a big deal. I, I would run an endurance race. But as long as the race, you're still in the race, you're still going. You're still going, which means there's a steady progression. 
which means that we are growing in grace, which means we're learning more about Jesus, which means that, man, I, I'm, I'm going to stick with what I know. I read this in Job this week about people removing the landmarks, removing landmarks. Landmarks are there for a reason. And we begin to remove them. So, well, let's change our Bibles. Let's change our singing. Let's change our... Uh, uh, look, I like singing out of hymn books. That's the way we're going to do it. We're going to sing out. We're not going to show it up on the wall. We're not going to do that. We're just simply not... But people say, well, preacher, you've got to stay up with the times. I mean modern times. We're living in modern times. You've got to put the songs up on the wall because people can't even read out of... We're not going to go there. But anyway... Well, preacher, we got to have a, they call them worship teams. I, I, I never could understand that. Uh, people getting up in church and, man, they're, they're dancing around. Saying, man, no, we, we want to have a steady progression toward that higher ground because we're going that way. We don't want to go back. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Brother Howells used to have this uh, illustration, and it's true. In 1945, here's the world right here. Here's the world here. Here's the church over here. Now, you know that the world has gotten progressively worse. I mean, it has gotten progressively worse. And we just live in perilous times, bad times. Here's, here's the world. Here's the church. The world moves over here. They've gotten worse. But the church is kind of, the church is kept, we're not as bad as the world. But they're, they're just, a, we're the same distance we always were, preacher. Yeah, but the world is a whole lot worse. And, and now, now churches, that is set before us a steady progression as we run the race. Why? There's a reason why. Because there's this great cloud of witnesses, of faithful witnesses, who are watching us, who are cheering us. I said in Sunday school, and I, I think that this is, I believe it's true. You, you can disagree with me on this, and we can still love one another about this. I do not believe heaven is as far as people think it is. I, I'm not sure that it's very far. I think that it's up that way. I do not think it's very far. I do believe that it is veiled from us so that we cannot see it. Uh, people, when they're dying, someone asked me this question. People, when they are dying, people who have been there when others were dying, heard them calling people's names out. I do not believe that heaven is as far as we think. I know of a person who was dying the day before they died in a pitch black room, said, look at all the beautiful lights. There were no lights. What did they see? I believe they saw that place that we call heaven. I do not believe it's very far. And I believe that there are people who are watching us, who are cheering us, who are encouraging us to run with patience the race. We are satisfied with our destination. Let's not be careless about the journey. Let's not be unconcerned. Man, we're, we, ought, we ought to have goals in life. Man, what is it that Jesus would have me to do? What is it that God would have me? Because he's got that course laid out for you. There may be obstacles along the road. There may be problems along. But all he's trying to do is get you to grow in grace, to be more like him. When the disciples were out in that boat, in the ship, Jesus said, let us pass over to the other side. Now, they're going to pass over to the other side. And as I've said, they may pass over to the other side underwater, but they're going to pass over to the other side. Why? Because Jesus said so. Our life may be like that. We're going to pass over to the other side. Boy, the destination, Canaan land is just in sight, just around the corner, around the block, just a little ways where it's not very far. But course may take us through some rough seas. The course may take us through troublesome seas. But Jesus is in the boat. He laid the course out. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. 
Why is it that we ought to run with this patient race with that slow, steady progress? Because there's a whole bunch of people that are cheering us on, that are waiting for us to reach our, our happy destination. But while we're getting there, let's not be careless about the journey. Let's run with patience the race, the course that is set before us. Why? Because we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let's not be care less about the journey. Father, we thank you again, Lord, for another day, and Lord, for the opportunity one more time to open thy word. Lord, we thank you for it. Lord, bless, we pray our hearts this morning. Lord, I pray. Lord, I pray. Lord, I pray. Lord, I, I think everybody here today would say, preacher, I'm saved and I'm on my way to heaven. And preacher, I really am. looking forward to our final destination when we finally make it home. Lord, we're looking forward to that. Lord, the people in here would say that to me. That we're, man, we're, what a day that will be. Lord, they would say that to me. They're looking forward to that. But Lord, help the preacher and help everybody in here today not to be careless be unconcerned about the journey, but Lord, help us to run with patience because we are running that race. Paul said, no, you're not. That race. They would run all, oh, Lord, you know that. Lord, you know it. So help us to run that we may obtain that prize that we press toward. Lord, it takes a lot, sometimes a lot of effort on our part. Lord, I pray that you'll help us, we ask. Not to be careless, we pray. Heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking. Maybe there's somebody here today say, Preacher, I'm not even in the race. I've never been saved. I've never asked Jesus to be my Savior. Now, I think I know most of you today, and I think most of you would probably say, Yeah, Preacher, I am saved. But perhaps there's someone today who would say, Preacher, I'm not sure that if I died today that I would go to heaven, but I sure would like to know that. And preacher, before you close today, would you please pray for me? Is there anyone? Slip their hand up. Preacher, pray for me today. I'm not sure about heaven. Not sure that I'd go, but I sure would like to know. I sure would like to know about that destination that everybody seems to be satisfied with when we get there. I'd like to know that. Anybody? One, once, twice. Father, I don't see any hands today. Thank you for this good day. Lord, help us to run now this race with patience that is set before us because there is a great cloud of witnesses that are watching us. Lord, bless, we pray as we go now. And Lord, give us traveling mercies. And Father, I pray you'll bring us back tonight, Lord, so that we can fellowship together. And Lord, have a good time in thy word, we pray. And Lord, we'll thank and praise you for it. In thy holy and precious and wonderful name, amen and amen.